Welcome back to our course on cognitive linguistics. Today we wrap up our lecture with a look at cognitive social linguistics. Today we'll look at the interaction of cognitive linguistics and social linguistics. We'll explore the issue of whether there are meaningful sounds, what football chants have to do with all of this, and how we can give a cognitive account based on construction grammar of social linguistic variation. Already back in 2009, Bill Croft pointed out that cognitive linguistics is in danger of construing itself too narrowly as an approach to language in the same ways that formal syntactic and semantic theories have been criticised as too narrow. This is not to say that the foundations of cognitive linguistics are invalid. They do offer a model of linguistic cognition that has greater potential than the formal alternatives, in my opinion at least. But they are incomplete. In particular, as my title implies, they are too solipsistic, that is too much inside the head. In order to be successful, cognitive linguistics must go outside the head and incorporate a social interactional perspective on the nature of language. So construction grammar and cognitive linguistics must account for cognitive as well as social factors. And for this, we need to look at social linguistic findings and ask ourselves how we can incorporate them into our theory. Let's start with Lebov's 1960 study of New York, which is the classic social linguistic study. His dependent variable was non-prevocalic R, so he looked at words like floor and forth. And before World War II, New York was largely non-rotic, whereas most of the US was rotic. Then the R-full pronunciation spread, and then you had variation. So people said floor and forth, with the retroflex R, and others set floor and forth without the R. Now, since Lebov suspected that different social classes used the R to different degrees, he went to three different department stores, Sex, Macy's and Klein. Sex was a more expensive shop, so he assumed that the shop assistants there mostly met more affluent customers, whereas at Klein, it was a more inexpensive shop, so you will get less affluent people there. And Macy's was sort of in the middle. And he basically assumed that the shop assistants adopted to their customers. Then in the shop, he had a rather ingenious way of eliciting the words that he was looking for. So he always asked for an item that he knew to be on the fourth floor. So let's just say he asked, where are the teddy bears? And the shop assistant would say fourth floor. And then he pretended not to have understood the shop assistant and said, excuse me, where? And then the shop assistant would say fourth floor. So therefore he got double the amount of uh, tokens. Let's look at the main results. As you can see, the pronunciation of the R's was variable. The most r pronunciation was found in sex, where more than 60% of the tokens had an R, and the least number of r pronunciations were found in Klein. Macy's, the store in the middle, was also in the middle with respect to the awful pronunciation. So what is a construction grammar interpretation of this? Well, pronunciations can become socially meaningful. They are for meaning pairings. In a shop, for example, if you sell skirts, then if you were in a more affluent neighbourhood and you had more affluent customers, you would say skirt. It would still be a noun, it would mean a piece of clothing, in particular a skirt, but the pronunciation pragmatically was indexed as being of an upper class pronunciation. And if you had many instances like floor and forth and so on, you went on to an abstract schema where you associate an awful pronunciation at the end of words or before a consonant with this particular class. What the New York study shows is that speakers make choices unconsciously or consciously. And these are subject to social and linguistic restrictions. For example, the R at the end of a word, as in floor, is more salient than in fourth, because there's a consonant following. Um, so Lebov also found that the one in floor was pronounced more often than the one in fourth. These choices, however, are largely unconscious, but they need to be mentally represented in order to be replicated and in order to spread across individuals. Speech communities, social groups, are recognisable by restrictions they place on the linguistic choices of their members. 
and then membership to a particular group is accomplished and maintained through cooperation through specific pronunciations. Let's go away from New York for the summer. Well, that's actually what a lot of tourists did. They went to an island off the coast of uh, New York called Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard used to be an old fisher village. And as you can see on the map by Aitchison, um, the summer visitors from outside usually arrived on the east coast. Now, the classic variable that Lebov looked at was the pronunciation of house versus house and life versus life. So there were two pronunciations available and in, ver and in competition for these two words. Historically, the older forms had the central vowels, so house and leif, they were earlier stages of the great vowel shift. So house should have moved to house, and it did so in most of the S, um, and life to life. But why did the old form survive and even seem to have enjoyed some kind of combat? If you look at the specific stages of this change, you will find that one social group, the fishermen, had retained the older forms in hosts and loaf. Another group, young men of the island that didn't want to go away and admired that group, also didn't like the tourists coming to the east coast. So in an act of linguistic identity, they subconsciously copied the fishermen's pronunciation. And then this old pronunciation with hosts and leif became the norm pronunciation for English men between the ages of 30 to 45. And then other social groups of different age and ethnicity could follow this model. If we compare the changes in New York and Martha's Vineyard, we do see considerable sociolinguistic differences. The New York studies a change from above, above the level of consciousness, as Lebov said. It's towards a super-regional standard, a socially accepted norm, and it has overt prestige, because the awful pronunciation was the prestigious one across the US. The older pronunciations of house and life are a case of change from below. They're from below the level of consciousness, away from the standard, away from a socially accepted norm, and towards a variety that has covert prestige in a local network. Both times, however, your social identity expressed itself by your pronunciation, and for this to be replicated, it had to be part of your cognition. You had to store these traces. Now, another thing that cognitive linguistics and construction grammar focus on is input and contact. So we do have these mental networks of constructions, but of course, we've also have physical social networks. If you look at how change goes and look at the graph from the right, which is from Milroy and Milroy's classic Belfast study, well, in Belfast, you had a Catholic West and a Protestant East. And the Protestant part of the pronunciation had a change going on that went from bad to bored and grass to gross. Protestant men were obviously leading the change, but when the Milroys looked at the Catholic part of town, they saw that it was actually Catholic women ahead of Catholic men in the West. The reason for this was that the women worked in shopping centers that were close to or in the vicinity of the Protestant East. So they came in touch with these new emerging pronunciations and took them from these networks to their own networks. If you then look at how change spreads on the left, and this is a classic early adopter um, model of change, then innovation is of course always innovated by a few. In this case, a few people in the Protestant East of Belfast. Then there are early adopters in the network in the West, and then it's crucial that central nodes in the Catholic networks picked up on this, and then it could spread. And then you have a landslide effect of an early majority, a late majority, and a couple of laggards who come in late. If you map this onto a time frame, what you get is a classic S-curve of linguistic change. So networks are important. Social networks crucially affect our construction network. This is also true for football chants. Quickly listen in on this song that's performed by West Ham and is their classic trademark fan song called Bubbles. So as you can see, this is not just a song. It's a football chant and it requires a multitude of singers and speakers. They have to perform it together. It's got a speech act, it's an appeal to stand firm, and it creates an identity and maintains it. 
From a communication psychology point of view to self-revelation, all the people who sing it are part of the network of West Ham fans. It expresses a fan block identity, and this group identity is also shared with the players, the club, the manager, the abstract notion, the abstract concept of West Ham. As you saw in the video, that includes body movement turning towards the pitch, um, facing it, you've got to have a scarf over your head or both hands spread out, and in the end, you clap in a certain rhythm and chant United. So in these cases, it's a sociolinguistic act of identity, and at the same time, you must have stored this song together with a clapping and when to chant United in your individual mind. Now, interestingly, football chants, which have a great uniting force uh, when it comes to binding together a group of fans, are not just fully frozen idioms. They're not just songs that are repeated in full all the time in exactly the same way. This is one of my favourite examples. Look at Liverpool playing Arsenal. Arsenal is 3-1 up, and you hear the Arsenal fans sing. Are you Tottenham? Are you Tottenham? Are you Tottenham in disguise? Are you Tottenham in disguise? As you can see, Arsenal weren't playing Tottenham, but Tottenham are their arch rivals. But this particular song is then used um, to mock the current opponent by mocking um, the fiercest rival. So you mock Liverpool by saying that they are just as bad as Tottenham are. But this is not just an Arsenal chant. This song is repeated throughout England in the Premier League and many other ch stadiums as well. Look at Northern Ireland. Um, when they were beating Spain 3-2, a rare enough oca occasion these days, they, the Northern Ireland fans were chanting... So they were singing, are you England, are you England, are you England in disguise? You can already see that there's a pattern underlying all of this. You go, are you football team, are you football team, are you football team in disguise, are you football team in disguise? And the football team has to be repeated throughout this pattern. The tune is Bread of Heaven, um, a Welsh hymn, which is well known, and which of course draws on the fact that in a church, people gather together that also have a joint identity and the singing of the hymns binds them together. And semantically, um, it has a very sort of simple meaning of saying our current opponent plays like this team that we mentioned and this team plays very badly, but it has got this social identity bit as well. So you identify yourself as being a fan of your team against them, the team that you mentioned, as well as the team that you're currently playing. There are usage constraints on the chant as well. If your team is behind, you can't really chant this. You need to be ahead and uh, sort of properly beating your opponent. From an elocution type of perspective, it's an abuse mockery construction. As you can see, this meso construction has got a slot for the football team, and it's used creatively throughout the English-speaking world. At the same time, there are specific micro constructions that specific fan groups might use as their way of binding together their social group and their network. So summing up, human communication is inherently social interaction. Sounds, pronunciations can be socially meaningful, as we know from legions of sociolinguistic studies. Football chants are important sociolinguistic acts of identity, just like socially meaningful pronunciations. They are conventionalized multimodal constructions that include stance, clapping, and lots of other bodily action. And this is where multimodal construction grammar comes in again. In the future, cognitive and social linguistic research must therefore inform each other much more, because our cognitive networks underlie our social networks, and our social networks shape our cognitive networks. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. This concludes this particular lecture. I look forward to seeing you again in the future.